Hello everyone, this is the Insert Title Show, and I'm your host, Wolf Strife. It is just me today, so uh, gird your loins and get ready. Uh, I guess I'll start off by just mentioning, no, I have not beaten Crisis 3 yet. In fact, I have not even played it since the last episode, but I'll get to it eventually. I don't know. My, uh, my drive for uh, beating video games has uh, kind of waned. Uh, this year, so, you know, I'll get around to it, but not really in a rush. But, uh, speaking of video games, uh, Xbox Live's got some great deals this, uh, I guess the rest of the month here. Uh, they got Halo Reach is, uh, the free game of the month right now, so if you don't have that, you gotta download it. I'm going to get my nephew Jacob to download it. I don't think he, uh, I don't know if he's ever even played it, so uh, that'd be cool for him. Maybe uh, get the guys together and we can do some uh, four-player co-op on it, so that could be cool. Uh, well, it's, uh, they got, um, never played these games, Was I think it's called The Secret of Monkey Island or whatever. They got the first and second one of that. It looks interesting, I don't know. It's kind of a remake of the uh, these old games from the 90s. I don't know, looks alright. Considering each one's only like $2.49, you know. I don't know. Might take a look. But uh, the big one for me is uh, Metro Last Light is on sale for 10 bucks. So uh, I've been wanting to play that for a long time. I mean, I loved the first one, Metro 2033. And, uh, I mean, I think that was in my top 40, I think. So, uh, I've been looking forward to playing the sequel for a while. I just didn't want to pay, you know, 40 bucks for it. So, I'll probably buy that. And, uh, if you haven't played it yet, Valiant Hearts is on sale for like $7.50. So, you know, go ask your mama for $7.50 and uh, go play that game. It's a great game. It's probably still the best game I've uh, played all year. Even though I was uh, looking at, I was looking up some information to see if they're gonna have some uh, DLC for it, because the game ends in uh, like mid 1917, so the war's still got like a year and a half to go. So I'm hoping they do some DLC. But I was, you know, checking out some info on it. I checked out Game Informer's review on it. Yeah, let's just say it's the re- it's you know speaks to why I have not respected that magazine in ten years. Yeah, they gave it a seven. <laughs> I think the reviewer's name was Jeff Juba. I'm not making that name up. Uh, he gave it a seven, and I was like, okay, maybe this guy this guy probably didn't even beat it because I remember a lot of their reviews sounded like the guy didn't even beat the game. But uh, no, he kind of goes into detail about it, and then he says, I beat him five hours. I was like, whoa, what? <laughs> that game took me like ten hours to beat. Granted, I did in one day, specifically because it was on the 100th anniversary of the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, so I was like, all right, I got to do this today. And, I, and I was also trying to get all the achievements, so maybe that's why it took me twice as long to beat it. And maybe he's just bullshitting about how long it took him to be it because uh, it doesn't tell you. So, I mean, I guesstimated about 10 hours for me. So, maybe his was closer to like 6 or 7 hours. So, yeah. Trying to get all the achievements, you know, you're having to find stuff. So, that takes time. Then I was like, all right, maybe he didn't read all the diary entries. Maybe he didn't look at all the historical stuff. And he mentions, you know, all that stuff. Doesn't really mean he read it all, but he just kind of made it sound... Well, he loved, I guess, the historical stuff and stuff, but he kind of made the story, I don't know, sound shallow or something, but it just didn't have as much impact on him, which made me think, well, maybe he didn't, you know totally get invested and to be fair this game's a lot better if you actually know something about world war one so yeah but i don't know i guess uh yeah maybe he and i just really disagree on the game 
But for him to give it a seven, I mean, dude. <laughs> you know how many few sevens I've played in my life? I mean, a seven is basically like, eh. Yeah. Like a six and a seven is kind of like, eh. An eight is good. And, you know, a nine is like, you know, very good. And then a ten for me is like, you know, awesome. Fucking awesome. Fucking awesome, dude. And, uh, basically, uh, anything better than a 10, which doesn't make a lot of sense if you think about it, but basically a game I think that's better than a 10, I usually just call it a timeless classic. Like, something that you're going to be playing, like, 20 years from now, you know. I basically give that moniker or whatever, <laughs> I give that distinction to uh, basically every Metal Gear game, Halo 1, you know, Dragon Age, basically my top 10 or top 20 favorite games. And if you listen to that episode, you know what I'm talking about. So for him to give it a 7 is just absurd. See now, that's, in my opinion, the best war game ever made. And he kind of mentioned, you know, the differences between this war game and, like, Call of Duty and stuff, which I consider Call of Duty games to be piles of shit for the most part. Even though Call of Duty 4 for the time was a really, really good game. But, uh, you know, Call of Duty 1 was a piece of shit. Call of Duty 2 was, you know, kind of a high-end piece of shit. But still, piece of shit. So, you know, he and I just are probably just two very different gamers, so... But my hatred and lack of respect for Game Informer goes all the way back to, uh, whew, I guess that was December 2004 when uh, the uh, very big issue of their magazine came out. I believe in it, they reviewed Metal Gear Solid 3, Halo 2, and Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. They gave Grand Theft... <laughs> They gave Grand Theft Auto San Andreas a 10 out of 10, which, you know, everybody agreed with. That was a great game. Then I believe they gave Halo 2 a 10 out of 10, which was fucking madness to me. And, it's, you know, they should be ashamed of themselves. Now, I could be wrong on that. Maybe they gave it a 9.75. Maybe they gave it a 9.5. But, you know, the point is they made it. They gave it way too much of a high score. The campaign in that game was shit. It was shit back then, and the remake that they're doing now is going to be shit. So, yeah. I never played the multiplayer. The multiplayer was supposed to be great. Groundbreaking. boo ba doo ba doo You know, whatever. I cared about the campaign. And if anyone back then remembers waiting for Halo 2 to come out, after you, you know, jerked off the Halo 1 for three years. That was a tough wait. Waiting for that. It seemed like every six months the game was being postponed. And uh, basically after I beat it, I said, well, I could have <laughs> done with another six months of uh, game development there. The ending was shit. I mean, it was just way too hard. The maps were boring as hell. It's just a terrible game. Uh, it's probably a six, speaking of. <laughs> it's probably a six in my on my scale. So, But uh, the reason why I stopped giving a shit about Game Informer was they gave Metal Gear Solid 3, my favorite video game of all time, a 9.5. A 9.5. And they gave a piece of shit like Halo fucking 2 a 10. God, those cocksuckers. <laughs> I, was, I was so freaking pissed. And I just went through Metal Gear Solid 3, uh, I guess I was like, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. Still, the greatest game ever made. I mean, my God. For, the, for anyone to confuse the greatness of Metal Gear Solid 3 with the shittiness of Halo 2 is, you know, they should be gang raped by a pack of mules in Tijuana. 
<sighs> but I guess aside from that, and that was another reason to hate Gamer Format to uh, give Valiant Hearts a 7. Alright, so, where was I? So, yeah, if, uh, if you haven't bought that yet, at least fucking download the demo. And if you don't like the demo, okay. But if you think you're gonna like it, you're gonna love it. So, fucking buy the game. $7.50. I mean, shit, you can't even buy a hand job for that? Well, I mean... Maybe an Oompy's family. Boom! Shaka laka. Oh my shock jock now. Alright, um, let's see what we got here. Um, yeah, a lot of sports stuff going on. I mean, Oscar Pistorius. I almost called him Oscar Piss <laughs> for some reason. Um, yeah, he got, uh, he was found innocent of basically first degree premeditated murder. But he was found guilty of culpable homicide, which I guess means kind of like manslaughter, I guess. Or, i.e., he fucked up and killed somebody. Which is kind of getting a lot of backlash, you know. And if you look at the evidence, it kind of looks like he meant to plug his girlfriend. But, you know, I don't know. Uh, I didn't, I, yeah, I just don't know enough about to have a fully, uh... Developed and uh, cogent, and give a flying fuck opinion about it. So I'm just gonna kind of nod silently and switch over to another sports topic. Um, yeah, Ray Rice thing still going on. A lot of people after the uh, after Commissioner Good Goodell's job, which I find kind of weird. Like, you're giving him shit because he didn't give Ray Rice enough, you know, a big enough punishment. Okay. Well, where's the fucking law, man? <laughs> I mean, hello. Why didn't they throw his ass in jail? Which they absolutely should have, I guess, because his fiance at the time didn't press charges. And yeah, no. That's kind of a big deal, not doing that. But, I don't know. That's just, yeah. My thoughts on the last episode are still true. I don't, I'm kind of glad he's not playing football. I mean, could you imagine the fucking backlash if he had started, I guess, this week or whatever? Oof. Oof. That would have been bad. But, on top of uh, this fucking fiasco, you have Adrian Peterson is in trouble for basically taking a switch, which is basically like a, you know, a stick, a flexible kind of stick, I guess, and beating the shit out of his four-year-old son. By the way, um, to be fair to Adrian Peterson, he's kind of a idiot, and I've known he was an idiot for a couple of years now. Uh, I don't know if anyone listening to this remembers, I guess it was back in 2011, 2012, the uh, league was uh, having a big dispute with the players. I think they uh, that's when the lockout was. And, uh, you know, I, can't, I guess the players wanted more benefits and the owners were like, you know, get back to work, you fucking idiots, <laughs> I guess. And, uh, you know, that kind of sucked. I mean, it almost cost, uh, almost cost the NFL a couple of games because the players weren't coming back to work. So, uh, that, was a, that was a potentially devastating, uh, you know, thing to have happen. But I remember during the middle of all that, it made a delightful uh, comparison between... Uh, being in the NFL and being a slave. I believe he said something like, it's been a couple of years now, but I think I remember the gist of it, that basically the owners treat the players like slaves. <laughs> just uh, just let that set in. You know, I'm sure he meant in a, you know, 150 years ago, South slave context, I'm sure he's thinking. All right. On one side, we have modern-day NFL players. They make millions of dollars. Some of them make tens of millions of dollars. They make millions of dollars in endorsements. You know, Gatorade, 
Nike, Adidas, Cups, you know, jockstrap deals. Basically, whatever they can whore themselves out to. Oh, let's not forget the delightful little sandwich shop, uh, Subway. Uh, by the way, Subway, you might want to stop, uh, endorsing people who get injured all the fucking time. Uh, so, yeah, they're pretty well paid. They get health care for them and their families. Yeah, they get women thrown at them. Especially Adrian Peterson, seeing how he's, I think he had about eight children with five different women. Yeah, very, uh, it's a pretty good indication of how intelligent this man is. Oh, and not to mention, uh, I think he's down to seven kids, seeing how last year one of his sons, that he didn't know about, actually. Uh, the mother's boyfriend beat his son to death. Yeah, so I kind of let you know what kind of women he's sleeping with, too, who would date a man that would do that to uh, a child. But, you know, to be fair to Adrian, he didn't know about the kid, really, and he had nothing to do with that. But still, you should, uh, you know, take responsibility for your actions. You fuck a chick without a condom, whatever comes out of her is yours as, you know, your responsibility. So, and on the other side, to get back to my point, you have 19th century slaves. Now, back in the good old days, well, <laughs> maybe strike out the, maybe strike the good, and just put old days. Uh, basically, if you were a slave, you could not go anywhere without your master's permission and then he would have to like write you uh, write you a permission slip kind of like in school basically and uh, you know you weren't free to do anything in fact it was actually against the law for anyone to uh, teach slaves how to read and write you know I guess they figured if uh, they're too dumb to do that well then they won't get it smart enough to say hey fuck this shit I'm out of here but uh, they couldn't, slaves couldn't congregate together, like say four buddies wanted to get together and talk. There had to be a white guy there to make sure that they weren't talking about getting the hell out of here. And, you know, let's say you're a black guy. You want to have a family. Well, you meet this nice chick. By the bing, by the boom. A couple of years later, you got a couple of kids. And then... You know, you're all living on the plantation, working your asses off, usually like sun up to sun down, seven days a week. In fact, usually the only day that you got off from work was Christmas Day. And uh, maybe New Year's, if you had a nice uh, master, which you had absolutely no control over. So, and then, you know... One day, a guy comes to the plantation and says, you know what? Walks up to the master and says, you know what? I'd like to buy, the, I'd like to buy those two nigger children there. I'll give you $1,500 for both of them. And the master is going to be like, you know what? Deal. <laughs> so there goes your children. You'll never see them again. And then maybe another time, a guy will show up and say, you know what? I want to buy that old nigger woman there. And there goes your wife. You know, and she's probably getting ass fucked by the guy <laughs> a couple of months later, and you know, you never see her again. Oh, and uh, not to mention the punishments for trying to escape and stuff. Oh, and especially when the abolitionist movement got going, you know, whites, uh, whites were kind of getting paranoid, so they didn't hesitate to, uh, you know, lynch any uh, blacks they could find, whether they be free men or not. You know, they didn't really care. They just wanted to put the fear of God into the slaves. So, uh, yeah, very, uh, very intelligent man, Adrian Peterson, comparing the <laughs> modern-day NFL football player to being a slave 150 years ago. Yeah, very, uh, very smart. All right, so basically he thinks it's okay to 
smack his four-year-old son with this switch. He says, you know, I was raised this way. This is what my mama did. The last time I checked, your fucking mother wasn't a six-foot-one football player. He was like 200 and something pounds. I mean, and the pictures of, you know, the reason why we know about this is because the child had a doctor appointment, and of course the doctors noticed these marks that the switch left behind, and they're pretty rough. I mean, I'll post the pictures on this video. I mean, a lot of red lines, he broke the skin and stuff, and, you know, and of course, when doctors see this, they have to report it. I mean, it's the law, you know, to protect uh, children from child abuse. And so he's in big trouble now, naturally. And uh, the Vikings actually sat him down this weekend. Uh, but it seems like they're going to let him play now, which, I don't know. I guess they're just going to let the law do its thing. So, but um, he says, you know, this is how I was raised, and I kind of didn't count how many times I hit him, but I think I hit him like 10 or 15 times. <laughs> a four-year-old with a switch. So, uh, I don't know. Like, it's, I don't know. I guess it's a cultural thing. You know, my mother never hit me. And I think a lot of kids, a lot of baby boomers who were hit when they were kids kind of stopped that cycle of violence. And if not with them, it was definitely Generation X, you know. There's a lot of people talking about that. And, uh, you know, on NFL Countdown on Sunday, Chris Carter and a bunch of the guys, Keyshawn Johnson and stuff, were talking about it, And they were all basically whooped when they were kids. You know, even Mike Dicko was talking about it. But uh, Chris Carter, you know. He was very passionate about what he said, you know. I would definitely recommend you go on YouTube or whatever and type in Chris Carter on Adrian Peterson. That's very, very good, very powerful. He's basically basically saying, you know, my mom did the best she could, raising seven kids by herself. <laughs> but, you know, hindsight has taught me that, you know, she didn't do everything right, you know. She made mistakes, and my mother was wrong, you know. And I thought that was that was great. That was definitely good. And, uh, you know, it's just fucking crazy. Now it turns out he might have abused another one of his sons. Uh, something about him having a, I don't know, a bruise or something on the back of the kid's head, and... Uh, and the mother calling him or sending him text messages saying, hey, I don't like you hitting my kid, you know. And he's like, am I going to, you know, am I going to be talked to like this by you? And so, I mean, it's just, it's just a fucking retard, I swear to God. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how that goes. But uh, I don't know. I mean, my mom never really hit me. I mean, I remember when I was like three, we had just got done watching the movie Ghost. I think somebody said the F word in the movie, so I was like in the kitchen, and I think I said fuck, and she just went nuts and <laughs> kind of hit me with a broom or something, and I was like ah! <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Maybe sometimes she would smack me with a wooden spoon or something. Remember Chili? Remember Chili? Uh, remember Chili telling me a story about his mom used to smack him with a spoon when he was like four or something. He'd be like, no, mommy, not the poon. <laughs> I thought that was kind of cute. But, you know, nothing, you know, nothing really serious. But, um, you know, I, and I never really saw kids, you know, getting smacked really. Well, maybe. I think my friend Danny, when we were like eight or nine, I think he was being a little shit or something in his grandmother who's like an, you know, 100% Italian woman from like Brooklyn or something. Sharon, I loved her. She was, she was great, great cook. Maybe she smacked him on the ass a few times, but you know, there's a big difference between a, like a 60 year old woman using her, using an open hand, smacking a kid on the ass and, uh, you know, full fledged football player using a stick. I mean, it's fucking ridiculous. 
Yeah, I mean, just imagine if there was video footage of that, because that's the only reason why the Ray Rice thing was big, because there was video footage. I mean, imagine this big-ass football player smacking the... You know, I can't imagine him smacking the kid like... <laughs> it was probably more like... <laughs> you know? And of course, the kid's going to be screaming bloody hell. You know? I mean, I'm sure if we saw this, it would just be like, just horrifying. That's kind of what bugs me, too, about the media. They're acting all self-righteous and shit. I'm like, where the fuck have you put those been for 50 years? I mean, how many boxers have we heard beating their spouses? I mean, I think even Muhammad Ali did. Sugar Ray Robinson did. I mean, just like every Mike Tyson, he actually went to jail for his. I mean, football players, I mean, celebrities. And they've just always been kind of like, eh, you know, it's bad, but, you know, when are they going to be back on the field or whatever? Hell, Floyd fucking Mayweather, like two years ago, went to jail for beating his girlfriend or whatever. And he's beaten a few, I think. I think it was uh, Mike uh, uh, Greenberg on Mike and Mike last week brought that to my attention. I was like, wow. Yeah, you're right. And, uh, I mean, they've swept it under the rug for decades. Look, I mean, I know it's not the same thing, but look at Tiger Woods. I've had to listen to all these guys, you know, make excuses. Oh, like, oh, I don't care. He cheated on his wife with, like, 12 chicks, you know. I don't care. I just want him back on the golf course. Oh, I don't care about golf unless Tiger plays. I'm like, what? Tiger Woods is a fucking dick. I mean, he treats the fans like shit. He treats the media like shit. He cheated on the mother of his two children like a fucking fire hydrant. While he went off and fucked basically everything with a cunt and an ass. I mean, he even fucked a porn star who afterwards uh, tried to get famous by doing a porno with a Tiger Woods lookalike. Yes, I kind of watched that video. It was disturbing as hell. Not quite as good as the uh, Obama lookalike having sex with the Sarah Palin lookalike. That, I guess that came out back in 08. That was actually quite arousing. But uh, other than that, um, I mean, it's just like, fuck Tiger Woods. I'm not, I'm not, I don't care if he was great back in 2000. What the fucking do? I don't even know if my balls had dropped yet. So it's just, you know, absurd. I'm kind of going all over the place, so I don't even know where I was, but fuck it. Let's keep going. But, um, yeah, I mean, just imagine, you know, Adrian Peterson going like Passion of the Christ on his four-year-old son. I mean, it's just ridiculous. But, uh, yeah, when I was a kid, you know, I didn't really see anything. I mean, I had friends whose parents were fucked up. I mean, I think the guy, the kid's name was Derek. His mom was a raging alcoholic. Like, who the hell, fuck. I think she was younger than my mom, but looked about 10 or 15 years older than my mom. <laughs> God. I remember, uh, I remember one time uh, back in, the, I guess this was like 97 or so, uh, me and Derek were like, uh, I think I traded him a couple of pogs. Anyone from my generation may remember those. Okay, I traded him a couple of pogs for like 10 cents. And, you know, he went home and stuff. Like 20 minutes later, his mom, drunk out of her mind, comes back over. And I have like my entire family over. I guess it was like a Sunday get together or whatever. And in front of everybody, she's like, Here's your pogs. I want my son's 10 cents back. Blah, blah, blah. My mom's like, Kathy, you need to go home. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think she, like, and then, I think uh, Kathy said I was, like, a hustler or something, and my mom got mad and slammed the door in her fucking face. <laughs> I mean, it was like, oh, my God. And I think that was a great moment on The Simpsons when uh, Nelson Muntz's mom, who's kind of like Derek's mom was, has a great moment when uh, she, like, shows up drunk. And I was yelling at Marge and stuff, and uh, it was totally 
totally deja vu. It was perfect. I wish I remembered the name of the episode, but it was like season now, 14 or whatever. Uh, but man, uh, but when I was a real little kid, like six or seven, I had this really good friend, William, who lived a couple of houses down. You know, in Georgia, that means like 200 yards <laughs> down the street. And uh, he and his sister, who I guess was a little bit older than me, who was like eight or nine, she was kind of hot, I thought, <laughs> at seven. I was like, hey, baby. So, uh, yeah, so uh, the three of us were really, really good friends, and uh, I loved William and his sister. They were great. I mean, he and I ran all over the neighborhood and stuff doing shit. And, uh, but man, I hated his fucking parents. Oh, my God. His dad was like a car factory dude. I don't know, so he probably worked at like Ford or something. Uh, I guess the car manufacturing factory, whatever. And I guess, his, yeah, his mom was this uh, fucking fat ass blob. He was probably like five feet tall. Probably weighed 250 pounds. You know, she walked. Basically, next time you guys get up and walk around. Walk like you don't, basically walk like you're trying to keep your inner legs, you know, your inner thighs from touching your balls. You know, kind of walk like that. That's how she would kind of like hobble down the fucking street, you know, she was so fat. Man, I hated his parents. And back, I mean, I've always been an asshole, you know. <laughs> if I didn't like you, you fucking knew it right away. I mean, I don't care if you were big or small, you know? Like, that's why I couldn't ride the bus when I was in elementary school, because I mean, I remember in first grade, you know, a fifth grader would give me shit, and I would give it right back and get my ass kicked, but, you know, I didn't care. I, was, I wasn't going to take shit from anybody. So, <laughs> so, a couple of bus rides like that, I eventually just stopped riding the bus. I think uh, either my mom would pick me up or I'd just walk home. I was only like half a mile from, my house is only like half a mile from school anyway, so. But yeah, so, I mean, me and his parents did not get along. I remember one, one probably one of the last times I took the bus home, you know, his, I was like, William, you know, come to my house, man, let's hang out. His mom would be like, no, he's got to, uh, William's got to come home and do homework. I'm like, hey, I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> you know, I have like six years old telling this kid's parent this. And, uh, you know, she and I got into like a argument. I'm like, hey, don't tell him what to do. You know? <laughs> so later that day, I go over to his house, like, you know, whatever. And then his dad's home and his dad's like, hey. I gotta talk to my wife like that, and I'm like, hey, your wife's not gonna talk to me and William like that. Yeah, so that's kind of how me and his parents' <laughs> relationship was. Oof. And uh, speaking of spanking, my mom, who was a single mother, basically, I think one time had them babysit me, so I had to go over to their house, and I guess I was giving them. The, parent, the parents crap, and the dad actually grabbed me and spanked me, and of course I'm crying like a bitch, you know, and I, he made, made me go and stand in the corner and stuff, and I'm just like, ah, you know, <sighs> so, um, yeah, that was one of the few times I was ever spanked, and uh, needless to say, I remember every single fucking time I've been spanked. And if I ever see that fuckhead again, I'm going to walk up to him and kick him right in the fucking balls. Um, but regardless, um, let's see. So, yeah, but, um, you know, I hated his parents. Loved his sister. And I loved William, though. Great, great kids. But uh, we had these other neighbors who I guess were closer to me, like maybe the house over. And uh, they were kind of cool. They had kind of a weird son. I think his name was Brandon. Yeah. But the dad had a motorcycle. And, you know, he just left it in the, 
you know, you have a driveway and then some houses, they have like a overhanging, I don't know, not really a garage, but, you know, like an overhanging roof kind of thing. So he kept his motorcycle, you know, up on the kickstand and, and there. And, you know, me and the kids thought it was fucking cool and stuff, so we'd like stand next to her and touch her and stuff. And uh, William's sister, God, I wish I could remember her name, but fuck me, this was like 20 years ago. Um, one day, I guess we were all there, and she was actually on top of it, you know, like, you know, you know, sitting on it, you know, legs down and stuff, like she was riding there or whatever. And um, I think me and William or Brandon or whatever walked off and stuff, and all of a sudden we hear... And we hear her screaming. I'm like, oh, she has bought. What was that? So we go running, and naturally the motorcycle fell over, landed on her leg. And if anyone's ever touched a motorcycle, they can be kind of heavy. This was more of like a, I don't know, kind of like a Kawasaki thing. It wasn't really like a Harley Davidson or anything, but, you know, this thing still weighed like couple of hundred pounds so I landed on her leg I saw her knee it's all like bloody and shit and she can't walk and this is what her cunt of a faggot ass fat ass mother did I guess because the father wasn't home she decided that she was gonna make her daughter crawl all the way back to their house like a hundred yards or so as punishment for her you know, being a stupid kid and being on top of this motorcycle. So she is making her daughter crawl. You know, her daughter is like on all fours, just crying, dragging her bloody knee across the fucking asphalt. You know, that rough asphalt with, so it's got like stones in it and shit. She's just dragging her knee. Blood is kind of smearing on the road. I'm like, oh my freaking god, and I'm like trying to be the hero, and I like actually pick her up, and like actually carry her a few feet, but you know, I'm seven years old, she probably weighs like 60, 70 pounds, so actually, now I don't, I don't get too far, and I drop her, and I'm like, ah, shit, I'm sorry, and I try and pick her up again, and carry her, and I drop her again, I'm sure this is doing wonders for her leg and shit. I remember just being so fucking angry at her cunt mother. I'm like, what, you too fat to carry your fucking daughter home, you fucking bitch? Ah. So she eventually gets home. They go to the hospital or whatever. It turns out she has a broken leg. So she has to wear a cast for, you know, a couple of months and stuff. Ooh. This is the first time I think I've ever mentioned this. Uh, anyone might as well share it with the whole fucking weird, I guess. Um, but I don't know what the fuck. I mean, you know, I was a little kid. I didn't register this as child abuse. I'm sure, I well, I don't, yeah. I mean, I've always had a sense of honor, I guess, from I gathered from history and the movies and stuff, you know. And I knew this was wrong, but I guess I didn't. I don't know. It's kind of hard to imagine I didn't mention this to my mom, but maybe I was just, you know, too young and I was like, yeah, I mean, you know what, mom, William's mother is a butthead. <laughs> you know, that, that, that doesn't really properly, you know, communicate child abuse, you know. So, I don't know, but, um, yeah, so that was, that was pretty rough and I still remember that vividly today. 20 years later. So, uh, she eventually got better and stuff. I think her leg was kind of crooked ever after that or whatever. But eventually, because William's dad was in the car business, car manufacturing business or whatever, he actually got shipped off to Japan. So he had the, the he and the entire family had to move to Japan because of the automotive uh, industry of there. So, you know, I got to say goodbye and stuff, and I missed them. I still do. I mean, I think me and William and his sister would have uh, been lifelong friends and uh, stuff. Maybe uh, me and the sister would have went, well, who knows? 
Um, yeah, that kind of bugged me. The crazy thing to think now is uh, his sister would probably be roughly about 30 years old now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, she probably wouldn't even remember this incident, but uh, eh. I guess volume's about my age now, so, man. Crazy, 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 crazy. So, uh, when this Adrian Peterson thing happened, that was kind of the only, you know, really kind of horrifying thing I could uh, remember. Thankfully, I guess. But, uh, yeah, that was just crazy, man. Fucking crazy. Boy, if I ever see their p parents again, man. God damn. <laughs> Hopefully his, uh, their fat-ass mother's dead. You know, I guess that's not a nice thing to hope for, but, man. Man, I fucking mean it, man. If I ever see his dad again. Whew, right in the kisser and uh, if he tries to get the cops or something say that's assault or whatever I'm going to be like well uh, he touched me when I was five <laughs> <laughs> yeah checkmate asshole yeah but uh yeah so that's kind of fucking nutty uh, another sports uh, topic uh Michelle Beadle is a cunt. And last time I talked about her, I actually edited it out calling her a cunt because I thought that was a little harsh. But no, she's a cunt. And basically, I realized she was a cunt, I guess, last year when she went on. Well, basically, Michelle Beadle was this kind of pretty mid 30 year old ch chick who was on ESPN uh, back in the, I guess, yeah, you know, about five years ago, she was on a show called Sports Nation with uh, Colin Cowherd. It was a great, great show. Very off the wall, very funny. You know, Colin Cowherd was great because he was like the sarcastic guy, and she was kind of the more straight, straight guy. It was a great show. Really, really great sports show. And then she kind of gets a little, you know, ambitious, and she runs off to uh, NBC. Because she wanted to work on Entertainment Tonight and still kind of have her own sports show, which she did called something I can't even remember. <laughs> can't even remember what that show was called. But yeah, she did that with uh, Dave Briggs, I believe. With Dave Griggs. Briggs? Well, let's go with Briggs. He was, you know, kind of a nice guy. I watched uh, a couple of times. He was on uh, Fox and Friends Weekend. Or whatever. And uh, so I was kind of pissed off at her for doing that, leaving ESPN and leaving that great show. And uh, basically, her replacement on ESPN uh, sucked ass, Carissa Thompson. Ugh. Colin Coward's still great, but yeah, her replacement sucked. But uh, the show that she did with Dave Briggs, you know, I was like, eh. It was only half an hour long, and it was just kind of, you know, just, I don't know. It's kind of stupid, kind of boring, just, you know, not good. And about five months into it, she kicked Dave Briggs off the show. I was like, okay. I didn't really think he was the problem, but okay. And she goes on the Dan Patrick show. I guess this was May 2013. And she is just a fucking bitch on there. I mean, she is not coming across well at all. She's talking about how she doesn't like Aaron Andrews, like they kind of had a feud going on, and she just kind of subtly trashes Dave Briggs. I'm like, what the fuck? This isn't very professional of you to be trashing, you know, co-workers on the show. I mean, it's like, what are you doing? And she talked about doing Botox and stuff, and I'm just like... Okay, what? You're supposed to be this fun, cool sports chick. Now you're just coming across as this dumb sports bitch, basically. He doesn't know how to be a professional. And uh, so ever since then, I've kind of been like, yeah. So eventually, she kind of does the show by herself for a little while. And it's just a pile of shit and gets canceled, I think, in September 2013. Then, I think earlier this year... 
She actually went back to ESPN and went back to her old job at Sports Nation, who is uh, now being hosted by Max Kellerman and Marcellus Wiley. Now, Max Kellerman's kind of famous for doing uh, boxing with HBO. He was a boxing anal analyst, and a very good one, too. I liked him. I like him a lot. And I loved Marcellus Wiley. He used to be uh, kind of the ESPN football player analyst guy because he played in the NFL. He's got the most jacked-up fingers you'll ever see when playing football. They're just all pointed in the opposite directions that they're supposed to be. And he was great. I loved him as an analyst, but I kind of thought he was a jerk to Max Kellerman a few times, so I kind of don't like him anymore. But he's he's a good guy, and I kind of hated his... Well, a lot of the black guys at ESPN, I think, are way too racially motivated and interested in stuff. And that kind of is off-putting to me because I don't give a fuck about race. Like, if it wasn't for people talking about it, I would never notice it. A lot of black people are going to be like, oh, bullshit, you're not colorblind. Da, 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 da. Dude, okay, I've probably had more black friends than white friends in my life. And that's a fact. The greatest enemy of racism, I think, in American history was the uh, desegregating schools back in the 60s. Because now kids are growing up with kids from all over the place. I mean, I, I mean, in elementary school, I'm going to school with black kids, Vietnamese kids whose parents fled, you know, the fall of Saigon and stuff, you know. I'm going to school with, you know, Hispanic kids from all over the, you know, Mezzo in South America. Maybe a European kid here and there. Like, I remember going in the 8th and ninth grade, I went to school with a guy from Germany. He was really cool. I mean, just, you know, that is the greatest enemy of racism. Because is, is kids are innocent. You know, if you like each other, you're, you're going to be friends. And if you don't like each other, you're just not going to hang out. It has nothing to do with race. And having to sit there on ESPN and watch these assholes talk about it, like racism is still prevalent. Do, 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 do. I'm like, yeah, with you guys. <laughs> Maybe when you assholes drop dead, it'll be gone. You know, Stephen A. Smith did that a lot. Rob Parker did that a lot. And that's why he got fired with the uh, Rob Parker incident. I guess that was December 2012 when he called RG3 a cornball brother. The thing was, first take was so crazy that year that I didn't even blink an eyelash to that. Because that was just how crazy that show was. So he ended up eventually losing his job. But, you know, but my Jones I like a lot, but then he goes talking about race, and it's just like, dude, come on. Fuck. I remember even them talking about, oh, why is Miguel Cabrera not getting so much attention? Because he's a fucking asshole. He doesn't talk to the media. He barely speaks English. And, yeah, he won the Triple Crown, but pff, ten years before, he never would have even sniffed the triple crown his batting average was like 330 which is really good but i mean fuck in the early 2000s i mean you had like todd helton hitting like 350 360 340 tony gwynn hell even barry bonds was hitting like 345 but he never got the triple crown because batting averages were so much higher he only had, and Cabrera, the year he got the Triple Crown, only had like 40 home runs or something. 42 home runs. That's pfft. Well, he did have a fuckload of RBIs. He had like 150 RBIs, so I'll give him that. But it's just like, I don't care about race. Okay, guys? But um, back to Michelle Beadle. I mean, so she's back there, and I, I refuse to watch Sports Nation because I think... ESPN should never have hired her back now because she's damaged goods. I mean, fuck that bitch. She left you guys and failed miserably. Fuck her. And, uh, you know, then when the Ray Rice thing happened, and I kind of covered this on another episode when she kind of came out against Stephen A. Smith for kind of mentioning, you know, women, you don't need to... You know, provoke and stuff. Which he admits he should have wor worded better. But he said like 18 times, under no circumstances should a man put, ever put his hands on a woman. 
Never. And he's got like four older sisters, so, <laughs> you know. And I have two older sisters, so, yeah, we know how it is. Uh, I don't know if I agree 100%. Never put your hands on me. If a chick's, like, doing physical harm to me, I'm going to put an end to it. I mean, I'm not a big guy. You got, like, guys like Mike Golick who are, like, six foot six, 300 pounds. I'm like, yeah, a five foot seven woman's not going to do a lot of damage to you, bub, but five foot seven, 140 pound woman can do me some harm. I mean, I'm only five foot nine and three quarters, and I only weigh, like, 155 pounds. I mean, you know, a woman smacking me around can uh, do some damage. Of course, I think uh, the best offense in that situation is a good defense, you know. If a woman's going to smack me in the face, I'll just, you know, touch my chin to my chest so that she hits the top of my cranium. I don't think she's going to want to hit me too many times after doing that. So, uh, you know, just, you know, let her wear herself out. Or let her do more harm to herself than to you. But it shouldn't even get to that point. You know, women have no right to be smacking guys around. And if it's the argument or whatever has gotten to that level to sleeve. Just fucking walk out of the room. There's no reason for that. But so uh, Michelle Beadle attacked uh, Stephen A. Smith for that and stuff. And uh, uh, she was on a podcast with Bill Simmons, who's like the honky NBA guy now at ESPN, who I never really, really liked. He's just kind of, eh. But um, she said on the podcast, I saw Smith's uh, comments and I was like, wait, what? I had such a reaction to it. I know that there are political ways you're supposed to handle things within a company, but actually I stand by the way I handled it, which basically she attacked him and actually somehow got him suspended for a week. And I was like, uh, shouldn't they suspend her too? This is kind of against the company policy you're not supposed to attack uh, fellow employees and stuff but now she's a chick and stuff so they let her slide and she says she goes on to say I wouldn't have done it differently I know it put a lot of people in awkward positions as far as like what they had to say and do but sometimes I just feel like you know just because we all work at the same place doesn't mean we agree with each other which is fine but uh, she goes on to say I don't know why that has to be such a big deal. It's a discussion. It's bizarre that I got blown up the way it did. You did on Twitter, you idiot. Of course it's going to explode. Then uh, Bomani Jones uh, kind of points out the hypocrisy. He says, so I can't talk company business here. The reasons are obvious. Beetle mentions, however, are a different story. and They are scary. He's just basically saying, what, she can talk shit, but I can't? Then she talks about, you know, basically people disagreeing with her on Twitter and stuff. And she says, when I retreat those, my dream is not to be like, oh, hey, let me engage with you. My ultimate dream and what I hope happens at least once before I die is that an employer of one of these morons one time is reading these and seeing the kinds of things that their employees are tweeting publicly and then just fires them. And then, you know, downward spiral for that particular person. I would love that. Holy fucking shit. She's basically saying, I want to get people fired and ruin their lives. Why is this person working at your business? I mean, fucking shit. They should have sat her down and said, yo... I know you're trying to make a name for yourself or whatever, but knock this shit off. This isn't, you know, Michelle Beadle Sports Network. All right. And uh, I loved some of the comments on this article. It was, uh, it was this guy, Mikkel Macon or whatever, said, uh, first of all, she lost me calling people morons. Very, very disrespectful. Michelle Beadle is not really a top reporter at ESPN and is trying to destroy other fellow employees to get her name and message out there. It's all a stunt, and if you follow her, she's mediocre at best. Stephen A. Smith is known for debate and going against the grain and now is, going, now is doing commercials. Uh, beef jerky or, or Beto or whatever. Terrible commercials. 
Uh, she is jealous and angry and needs to get a grip. People can have different opinions and don't have to bow down to her. No respect for her and Bill Simmons disappoints me dealing with her. Another guy named Barno One said, Wow, I never realized Michelle Beadle was such a hate-consumed hate person. Her dream is that someone who insults her on Twitter gets fired and their whole life spirals out of control. Jesus, Michelle, get a grip. Hey, man, man. I mean, just fucking shit. And if you're thinking, I uh, just don't like female sports people, there's a couple of sports chicks I love. I love Sage Steele on ESPN. She is great. You know, she seems like a great woman, too. I mean, and Susie Culver, I love her. I mean, Pam Oliver's good. It's just, you know, I don't like Michelle Beadle. I don't really like Aaron Andrews. You know, whatever. So what? Carissa Thompson sucks, but, but you know, that's my opinion. Um, let's see. I know this one's taking a, this one's kind of running long here. I mean, Twitter really is not a good place for you, for famous people to go. Really is not. But, uh, yeah, it's just some crazy stuff. I guess I'll end, uh, end this uh, episode on this note. Um, back on September 13th and 14th, I guess I was, what was that? Saturday and Sunday was the 200th anniversary of uh, the attack on Fort, Mc Fort McHenry in Baltimore Harbor. Uh, if you don't know, Fort McHenry, the attack on Fort McHenry is where the Star Spangled Banner thing happened. You know, the British bombarded the fort and stuff, and then on the morning of the 14th was when Francis Scott Key, when he was on a British uh, warship or whatever. He was like, oh, say, do you see? Is our flag still there? So that was really cool. And they, on C-SPAN 3, they did a nice ceremony from the fort and stuff. And I've actually been to Fort McHenry. Went there back in, like, 2003. It was pretty cool. Pretty cool. And they did a lot of cool stuff. They uh, rose the flag that was like exactly like the original one. The original Star Spangled Banner is actually in the Smithsonian, so uh, I wouldn't mind seeing that one in uh, one day. And uh, Colin Powell had a very nice speech. I mean, it was, it was a very nice ceremony and stuff, so that was really cool. That was probably the most times I've ever heard the Star Spangled Banner played. I mean, that one ceremony, they played it like three times. Then, of course, that was NFL Sunday, so they it was cool, though. They made mention of it and stuff, and uh, then I had to listen to those Star Spangled Banners and stuff. Uh, I actually watched football this weekend, so uh, the Falcons got their asses handed to them, but, yeah, it's a pretty interesting week. A lot of teams uh, we thought were going to be good suck balls, and a lot of bad teams were doing okay. Well, you know, whatever. It's only week two. This weekend is going to be interesting with the Adrian Peterson and Ray Rice thing. But, uh, whatever. So, uh, take it easy, guys. Uh, I might actually do an episode, another episode pretty soon. But, uh, we'll see. And uh, I'll try and get the guys on. Uh, I know I need to do those episodes with Scully and stuff. And uh, maybe if we can all get together, we can all do an episode. But, uh, whatever. I just wanted to do this one stuff. So uh, take it easy and uh, keep watching. Oh, and uh, here's a really faggish thing for me to say. If you like the show, tell your friends about it. <laughs>